Chapter 2, Planning and Providing Special Education Services. This is the chapter that we'll build other courses on. If you're a SPED major, uh, you're going to get a lot of looks at this, hopefully, and, and all the courses, at least in the courses I teach, we'll come back to some of these concepts. But uh, for the most part, this will be your only exposure to what I would call uh, the inside of special ed, the inner workings. Um, pay close attention, and I can't possibly uh, do justice to this in the time I have here, but it'll be a flyover from 10,000 feet what makes special education work. All the chapters going forward now are supportive things of this uh, planning and providing the SPED services. If you're not a SPED major, you will still be involved with this, as you'll see as we go through this chapter. And so this is the one you want to kind of wrap your arms around, and, and I could really spend an entire course breaking this apart into small pieces and studying each piece. But you're going to get the 10,000-foot flyover, so buckle up. And I'm sorry, this will be kind of long. Planning and providing special ed services, Chapter 2. Here's the focus questions from the textbook. This is interesting. This teacher, uh, the only thing about here is uh, she has uh, some things about working with people. Um, it's about being a sped. She talks in one place in here, I can't remember where it is now, about working with a teacher that was very uh, territorial and not very cooperative. I thought that was an interesting thing to write that they would publish that. This is about Chapter 1, what we did there. Uh, and that is that we examine the process by which this is planned. Uh, in chapter one, we talk about how do teachers know what kinds they do. Here, it's uh, it's about the, the importance of uh, teaming and collaboration, uh, in the IEP itself, the least restrictive environment, and inclusive education. And you'll want to get familiar with some of those terms because, at the very least, coming out of this course especially this chapter, you're, you're going to be very familiar with those terms, and I'll try and really key in on those as we go through it. So what is this process of special education? Well, the IDEA, Individuals with Disabilities Act, and right there is the first thing that you have to be familiar with what that is. Uh, going into the College of Ed, you're going to have to know this. We're going to ask you questions about it in the interview for the College of Ed. Uh, it's just a term when you interview for jobs, you have to have a thorough understanding of what this is and what that, and short it, it's the federal act, it's federal law, it's the federal government telling you uh, what has to be. And uh, what's interesting about special ed from the very beginning, it's been dictated from top down. Education was, uh, you know, not even mentioned in the Constitution, uh, both mostly from the, our history, ha has been a local up. Uh, type thing, but fed, uh, special ed was birthed at the federal government level and it's been forced down and this is one of the reasons it's so cumbersome. We see special ed teachers get so burned out and stuff because it's a federal government initiative. So it mandates a sequence of events schools must follow and I, you got to have that word to know it's a federal government thing, must uh, follow to identify and educate children with disabilities. So th it's a little tricky there because you have to identify them before you educate them. And remember what we talked about in the last chapter, that the biggest group have mild disabilities, they're invisible. When you get down to some more severe and those low incidence disabilities, they're more uh, visible to see. Although the federal rules and regs, uh, regulations the state and local agencies must follow are lengthy, detailed, and over, sometimes redundant for legal purposes, the process that they specify is designed to answer a sequence of questions. And here they are. Which students might need special ed? Does this particular child have a disability that adversely affects his educational performance? And that's a question that you have to answer each time you look at a child, decide if, uh, how to serve them is, does their disability affect their educational performance? Because you could, uh, I have a brother that's missing a hand, what should be called an impairment, doesn't affect, never affected his educational performance. He wasn't a very good student, but it had nothing to do with that. In other words, a student eligible for special ed, if the answer is yes, then you go on. What are the special needs result in that child's disability? What do they need because of it? And again, this is a subjective process to make this determination. What specialized methods of instruction, accommodations, curriculum things they need? Down here, what effective, what educational setting is least restrictive? 
and is as special at helping. And this is the one I think is changing for the better because when I was teaching, we didn't ask this enough. Is special ed helping? We didn't have to ask that enough. And if not, what change would be made? It's called accountability, and I know it shakes teachers to the core to be accountable for their learn for the students' learning. And I've said before, uh, that's how teaching has changed. That's how teaching has changed in your lifetime compared to my lifetime. Is we really now look at effectiveness of teaching based on learning. Where when I was uh, sitting where you're at learning, uh, it was a pre-service teacher learning this process, it was all about teaching. We didn't ask questions about what was being learned. We only evaluated and looked at teaching. Where now you have a different set of standards for you, we're going to evaluate what's being learned. So here's the steps, and let me jump over uh, to here. Let me jump over here. It's the notes that goes with it. There's your focus questions. Maybe I should hit those again. Uh, why must uh, the planning and special ed be carefully sequenced and evaluated? What are the intended functions of pre-referral? And we'll talk quite a bit about that coming. What is disproportionate representation? I started this on last chapter, and they really spend too much time on it in this chapter. How do collaboration and teaming impact this? And there's a lot on here about this. I, I, I'll try and get you through that, but it's, it, I think it gets a little carried away too. This is, this, is, this is a big one. You know, what's the quality of that IEP? Here's that least restrictive environment I mentioned. These are important parts. What else must be in place for a student to receive appropriate uh, education in an inclusive classroom? And they spend a ton of time on this. In what ways has SPED been most successful? What are the greatest shortcomings and challenges? And it doesn't, uh, it spends too much time on that also. We'll come back to that. But here's the process. And they get carried away, especially when we get to this uh, 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 multi-factor, this non-discriminatory. That's really take off on disproportionate uh, crazy. But the first one is pre-referral, then evaluation, identification, program planning, placement, progress and monitoring. And you really uh, will have to be familiar with those steps uh, all the way through. This is what special ed is about, is these things, these five things. To, what is the pre-referral? How do you evaluate and identify them? How do you plan the program? How do you place them? We'll talk about placement. Placement is where is that service going to be delivered? And then how to monitor, review, and evaluate that. There is special ed right there. Okay. Yeah. Then we, here's the disproportionate stuff, and I'll come back to that. All right. Let me uh, go back to the textbook and bring you in on this, this pre referral process. Um, before you before referring a child for a formal testing and evaluation for special ed most schools initiate a pre-referral intervention process and there again if you're the regular classroom teacher this will be in your lap okay but how do they get to that point well this part here talks about that. Let me, if you would allow me to read that, a child who may need special ed services should you come to the school's attention because a, a teacher or parent reports concerns about differences in learning behavior or development. Okay, let me make that the first entry here uh, on here, and this is our number one entry. And I'm going to uh, move it back here and say, before this, one, how referred? How are they referred? And there's an A, a B, and a C, I believe, that you'll bring in here into your notes. The B is results of screening tests suggest a possible disability. Screening tests are relatively quick, inexpensive, and easy to administer assessments to large groups of children to find out who might have a disability and need further testing. For example, most schools have a screening, vision screening test. That is the, full, the, the small testing. But here's the one I want you to highlight. Is parents can refer. Parents can refer. Parents can ask for an assessment, and the school must abide. It's a relatively little-known thing, but if you, 
as a parent think your child is struggling, you can ask for a full special ed evaluation. Now having said that, before you start advocating for this for the parents of the children in your classroom, know that you have to live with the results of that also. And that's why students, or schools, parents, teachers are a little bit reluctant to jump to this because once you do that assessment, you're really kind of bound by the results. I mean, you don't have to implement IEPs, but now all of a sudden you, a lot of other things kick in. So normally before, before a teacher, a parent, or a screening test refer them, you go to what's called a pre-referral intervention process. And this is important because this is on the test, says IDEA does not mandate pre-referral. Does not mandate this. All right. I'm going to come back to these steps here. It's a little long and things. See, does not require pre-referral intervention. Local agencies may use up to 15% of their IDEA funds. So there's money, you can use it for that, but it's not mandated. So you can use up to 15% of your sped, your federal money to re, uh, reimburse and develop and implement coordinated early intervention services. And uh, that's to try and, uh, you know, ward this off. It's to try to keep that from happening is what that's about. Okay. So, uh, for students in kindergarten to 12th grade who have been identified as needing special ed services who have been additional academic and behavior support in this environment, okay? Pre-referral intervention is often conducted by a building-based uh, early intervention assistance team called student support team, teacher assistant team, something like that. When I was teaching, we called them TATS, teacher assistant teams. Um, and so in here, is who's involved with that and so I need you to write a paragraph about that if you would and so number uh, two entry is uh, about the tat who is on it and what do they do so that's number two, and please uh, mark these by number one, number two, and make them red like that so I can find them in your notes. Okay, so that's about the tat. Now it goes on, and this is, there's more about this in the future, and, and again, this, this whole process here, this response to intervention, RTI, you have to be familiar with that. If you're going to be teaching the public schools today, that's a big, big part of the terminology. It's in the, it came around, um, let me see there. Uh, their uh, information here is from 97, but I would say it's about uh, 10 years old, really came on strong in the last five or six years, and now almost all schools are using this model of RTI, this response to intervention. So now you have to know what it is, you have to know what that stands for. Okay, and so I want you to put that in your notes right here. That's number three. All right. And it's a um, formal and systematic pre-referral pre process called response to intervention. How a student responds to increasing intensive scientific validated instruction can help determine whether the child's struggles to learn are the results of poor or insufficient instructions or of a disability when special ed is needed. Okay, now just think of that, chew on that a little bit. The idea of this is to determine is, is it poor instruction or does a student need special ed services? Okay, yep, get nervous, get nervous, yeah. We're gonna find out if it's you and the methods you're using. So you need to have what I have highlighted down here, scientifically validated instruction. Okay, scientifically validated instruction. And so you are going to write me number four here, what that is. So there's your first four and you've turned them red and you've re uh, responded to that. But what is scientifically validated instruction? And again, why that's important? Because we're going to expect you without hesitation to know what that is. Because it goes with the data-driven instruction that we use today. What is data-driven? That everything is counted and quantified, assigned a number. That's how we keep track of learning today versus when you and I were in school. 
So the idea of RTI is to provide early intervention in the form of scientifically validated to all children whose performance suggests they are at risk for school failure. RTI involves universal screenings, continuous monitoring, student progress. That's all a bunch of gargly goop to you at this point. But it's a way of using data to do that and then determining how to serve those schools. So I, I clipped this. And I should have brought this in. RTI was conceived and is most often used as an early intervening system for reading difficulties and for identifying students with learning disabilities. Okay, there's the first statement. It's conceived and often used for early intervening systems re for reading and identifying students with learning disabilities. Most states, okay, and this is huge because this is a little bit different. Most states permit local school districts to use RTI to identify students with learning disabilities. Remember before what I said it was? It was parents and uh, uh, teachers could refer them. Now the RTI model, because we're counting, we're keeping track of how fast they're learning, what they're learning, how many vocab words, how much math they can do, how fast they read, how many comprehension questions they answer. We're tracking that. That's data. That's quantifying it. And then if we find they're falling behind, they're same people, same kids their age, you can refer them for a special ed evaluation. And South Dakota recognizes this as one of the ways. And 12 states require districts to implement RTI. Our state has not required that, but moving towards that. The logic of RTI has been extended to other literacy skills like math and social behavior support if they have problem behaviors in the classroom. And it says RTI is farther in Chapter 5. And again, the problem with Chapter 5, we're going to be flying over that also. All right. Regardless of its form, a pre real intervention is designed to achieve the following. Okay. And here it is. There's one, two, three, four, five, six of these. And so, again, I'm going to take this to you. This is... Uh, ask you to bring those in is number six is the goals of pre-referral. So you have six things here. Stop this on each one of these and go back and bring this in and write number six and, and tell me what are those goals. And again, don't put all this in. Uh, you can really um, abbreviate that or bridge this. I want to know here that you understand what the goals of pre-referral is. Okay, this down here, school, a school district may not use RTI or any other form of pre-referral intervention to delay formal evaluation and assessment of a student who is eligible for special services. At uh, any time during the pre-referral process, parents have the right to request that their child receive a comprehensive evaluation of identification and eligibility. So again, at any time, a parent can request this. I thought they would throw this part out when, with the strong adoption of RTI but it's still here. It's, it's a parental safeguards. Even though a student hasn't been identified, uh, a parent can make this request. And of course, it has to be in writing. And the school has to respond to it. And there's been a number of case laws where this didn't happen, where the school was forced and found out of compliance for not responding. And I've heard parents tell me how they requested this, and the thing laid there for a year or six months. And what was the problem with that? The parent was telling me they felt the child got farther behind because the school wouldn't uh, do the evaluation. So that was the first one, pre-referral intervention. Okay. So provide immediate instruction and or behavioral assistant in response to intervention. Here's the RTI process. So now evaluation and identification. All children suspected of having a disability must receive... Here's the two words they love, and I get sick of, but the non-discriminatory, and I say they spend many pages on this, multi-faceted evaluation. Uh, in slang, in special ed world, we call this an MFE. But in your world, whether you're the SPED teacher or the regular ed teacher, you have to know what that is without hesitation. You have to know what, what MFE, multi-faceted evaluation, is. So let's take a look at this. 
multifaceted. It, uh, eligible and SPED are related services. A child must have a disability and need specifically designed instruction. ID requires that all children suspected. Here's a word. And how do we say suspected? It goes back to this. Who can refer? How are they referred? A, B, C. So A is uh, teacher, B is parents, and C is RTI. Okay, so anybody suspected must have a, receive a non-discriminatory, multifaceted evaluation. Either the school or the parents can request the child be evaluated for SPED. Regardless of the source, the parents must be notified of the school's interest to test the child, and they must give consent. Okay, this is a little tricky. You've got to be asking yourself why, but then, again, this is what we'll call, uh, we'll talk about it, a procedural safeguard. So, this is what's hard, and I've dealt with this more than once. Child struggling, child not doing well, child falling behind. Teachers say, we would like to evaluate this child for special education services. Parent says, no. Why would parents say no? Okay. Let's make this here um, number seven, and you give me some reasons why they would say no. And you mark it for me, number seven. Why no? Why would they say no? Why would they say no? Within 60 days, okay, and this is on the test, you have to know this. 60 days of receiving the parental consent for evaluation. The parent has signed the form, and this is all done with paper. Uh, now there's some uh, t uh, digital stuff, electronic stuff, but uh, for our discussion here, it's a piece of paper that comes home and says, please sign here if we can, uh, you know, uh, uh, whether the parent requester or the school, sign here, and then within 60 days of receiving that back from a parent, the school must complete the evaluation. Again, that was to prevent the schools from sitting on these when you would come to check on say, we're doing it, we're doing it. 60 days not to start it, complete, and make a determination. So 60 days, not school days, calendar days. So if we do it on the 1st of February, the end of March, it has to be done, completed. And so in 60 days, they must complete and determine whether the child has a disability and identify the educational needs of the child. So in 60 days, this has to be done. And I say that's, and this is the evaluation part now. Idea is explicit in describing some do's and don'ts the school district must follow when evaluating the child. Uh, conducting the evaluation, the local education uh, agency, uh, a, use a variety of assessments tools. Okay, so you have, can't use one. Variety. If there's only one test, that's what RTI, it can't be just RTI. It has to be other assessments. You can RCR to use RTI to refer. It can be part of this, but if you come to a determination only on RTI, it's invalid. Has to be more than one test. Has to be multiple things. That we go back to multifaceted and multifactored evaluation. Can't be one th just one thing. Whether a child is a child with a disability and the content of the child's IEP program included in this. All right, this is uh, this is interesting. Uh, two research-based things that you want to maybe want to take a look at. One is coral responding, and the other is response cards. Just two things to increase participation. Um, and kids with student disabilities, you're, this is, you're always after this. And if you uh, ever struggle uh, with kids, and I just had somebody ask me the other day, what do you do with this kid that won't participate? Here's two ways to help somebody participate that has some learning needs. All right, and it follows all this, and it tells you the research behind it and that. But here we go back to those parts of this. Not use any single measure or assessment, the sole criteria. So like I said, it can't just be an IQ test. It can't just be an aptitude test. It can't just be RTI. It has to be a combination of those things, multifactored, and technically sound 
instruments means there's good science behind them, those types of things. And then additional requirements of this, each local education agency, what's a local education agency? Well, it could be the school district, which it most often is, especially in a big district, but in our smaller communities where you somebody other than the local school does the assessments like an educational uh, um, co-op or something like that, they'd be known as the local education agency. And the uh, acronym for that, of course, is LEA. We had that on the other page. Then assessments and other evaluation materials used the child have to are selected and administered to be non-discriminatory not be discriminatory and they're very concerned about this and they they go into this in a second on a racial or cultural bias are provided and administered in the language and forms most likely to yield accurate information on the child i remember one time i had a kid student that came that was new to this country his parents were migrant workers he was 14 his mother was uh, uh 30 i think at the most the man in the house wasn't the father, was not married to the mother, but he uh, ran the house, dictated the house and stuff. The child was out of control and couldn't read. And so I got the bright idea that he, w he could do Spanish. And so I had him assessed for reading. Uh, I had him uh, assessed for language in English and Spanish, and he couldn't read a lick of Spanish either. But what his real issue was, as a migratory worker, he had large, large gaps of time he wasn't in school. Not sure he was legal in this country, but he uh, he had large gaps. And what was really interesting is the parents didn't speak any English. So think of this mistake. When they came in for the initial referral, the initial meeting, he was the interpreter. I only had to make that mistake once. <laughs> Kid was just a real behavior problem and stuff, and he's interpreting for this uh, this man and his mother. Mother told me she was scared of him through another interpreter, scared of the child. Yeah. Uh, so they've got to be administered in the language and form most likely to yield the accurate informa information are used for purpose for which the assessments are valid and reliable and you don't understand what that is you have to take the assessment class to get what that means uh, they have to be administered by trained and knowledgeable personnel and most of our special ed teachers if you're a sped major you will be that person uh, you won't be trained to uh, really to administer the uh, IQ tests, but certainly all the other achievement tests and administer in accordance with any instruction provided uh, to produce such assessments. Okay, and the child is assessed in all areas of suspected uh, disability because it could be behaviors, uh, it's reading, math, uh, you know, uh, cognitive things, whatever the area is, it, you, you attest for it. Uh, who transfer from the school district to another district in the same academic year are coordinated at prior to the subsequent schools. Why is that important to this transfer? I'm telling you, these kids that come from low-income homes that have learning problems transfer a lot, and that's one of the things that we never talk about. But you cannot believe how thick the files are. I would get them in middle school, and they've been they're in seventh grade now, and they're in their ninth or their tenth school. And with that, like I said, they would have sometimes weeks, uh, maybe even months, where they weren't in any school. I remember I did an intake and scheduled a student one time that the mother, uh, another one of those cases where the mother was just a little bit older than the student, and the mother saying to the student, I told you if you didn't behave, you'd have to go back to school. And that kind of told me where that was coming from. So the MFE, the multi-factored eval, is conducted by school-based multi uh, multi-disciplinary evaluation teams, sometimes called student study teams. Idea stipulates that a child shall be not be identified as a child with disability in the child's learning difficulties are the result of lack of appropriate instruction in reading. And of course the challenge is to determine that. Lack of instruction in math or limited English uh, and those types of things. Uh, the question I'll ask you whenever I see this and, and used to get slapped in the face with this, is what do you do with the child then? What do you do with a child that's, uh, that's delayed behind their age mates that you say, oh, it, this is for a lack of instruction? Well, of course you would enhance the instruction, but how long do they have? Now, this is their long uh, diatribe about this uh, disproportionate representation. Remember, I talked last week that, you know, that should be uh, the uh, representation of special ed uh, should equal the representation in the school. And it's well documented that it's not always that way. So let me flip back to the notes and see what it says about this. We're still in this non-discriminatory part. 
and here's their concerns. Disproportionate representation of students with culturally and linguistic diverse groups in special ed are children wrongly placed in special programs, resulting in being denied appropriate interventions. Is that why they're there? Are children overlooked because of their membership in specific ethnic groups? So you may over-identify because you're, you're a racist, or you may under-identify because you're a racist. Are students from some ethnic groups more likely to have a disability? Do inherent problems in the referral and placement process bias identify minority children? And then it says an incongruity between teachers and culturally linguistic diverse groups and families, which may lead to biased referrals. And the, I'm going to go back to the text for that. Inaccurate assessments of culturally diverse students, meaning you don't use the right assessments to fit their culture. Ineffective curriculum instruction practices for these cultural diverse students. And here's the question I'll have for you again. If this is the case, what do we do with students that have fallen behind and are disruptive in the classrooms? This author, Heward, uh, uh, su uh, suggests that your, it's your racism that's causing this. It's your racism uh, that's causing this. Can I jump back to this? This is your number uh, eight thing. It should have been seven, but I'm going to bring it to eight now. This is, I, I have a video on the front about students in this, and it talks about, um, it's here, and it's this RTI video on YouTube, and it talks about these three tiers. And I want you to know what are uh, what percent of students fall in each of the tiers here. All right. There's three tiers. Tier 1, Tier 2, Tier 3. It's in the lecture, but the video does a wonderful job of explaining those different tiers. So that's 8. We're still on 8. Okay, 7's here, eight's back there. I know, a little confusing. You'll figure it out. But I want to go back to the textbook now about this disproportionality. And they've, believe me, they have spent an inordinate amount of time on this. Uh, exists when a particular group represents special ed at a rate significantly higher or lower than would be expected because of the proportion of the general student population. That's what I drew last chapter. Culturally and linguistically diverse students are both overrepresented and underrepresented in SPED depending on the group of disability category. Shows this risk ratios. Risk ratio is the relative likelihood of a member of a given group be in the case receiving SPED compared to um, others. And here it is, and I'm not quite sure how to interpret this, but they're one more point eight times, meaning they're you know they're a higher percentage. One would be the same. Uh, obviously, the Asians are under, Black Africans, Hispanics, and white are less than the norm. So one would be even. One would be what it should be. It should all be one to one. So you can see the most over-identified one. They are dispar I shouldn't say over-identified. Disproportionately identified is this Indian Alaskan Native, and the under one is Asian. And of course, the whites, the racist ones, um, are under-identified. Then it goes through the different disabilities. So that's their evidence. That's the evidence that you you racist people are. are uh, are misidentifying these students or over identifying or under identifying them. Remember it's age six to twenty one. Because before that they're, they're it's not a school, uh, they're not in a school. Risk ratio of one means the number of students who are identified as given a disability matches that proportion. All right. And for this, for decades, I hear in the yellow, reports and census studies have shown that three groups of culturally students, African American, Hispanic Americans, and Native Americans, have consistently been underrepresented in gifted education programs. Is this disproportionate representation appropriate? Okay, they go into a long diatribe here. If it means that children have been wrongly placed in SPED programs that deny them appropriate educational interventions, match their full learning capabilities, 
stigmatize them, segregate them. So in other words, it's constant inference that it's a racial a racial thing. Found that African American students with disabilities were more likely to be placed in more restrictive educational settings than were white students with disabilities. And then two two shows that. Disproportionate representation is also a problem that means students with disabilities are overlooked because of their membership. Now they go into the causes. The causes have been difficult to pinpoint and often controversial. Yes. Are students from some culturally and linguistic diversity groups likely to have a disability that are than are than are students from some culturally and linguistic diverse groups more likely to have a disability than white children? For example, a much greater proportion of students from diverse groups are born to mothers without access to maternal care and live in poverty. Factors associated with increased incidences of disability. Okay. Now, I will uh, contend to you is that's not true because they are all available now. The government funds billions of dollars into these programs, so they have access. So if they're not, it's their choosing. Often what this is is denial of a pregnancy, uh, often born to very, very young mothers, but because of that, you're the racist. Half of the nation's Latino fourth graders and almost half African-American fourth graders attend public schools in which more than three-fourths of the students come from low-income families. And then they, they base this on their eligibility for free or reduced lunch. And this is how we count uh, low-income students in school as who applies for free or reduced lunches. And that's a whole other conversation about figuring that out. By comparison, only 5% of white fourth graders attend schools with poverty rates high, this high. As some researchers have suggested, do inherent problems in the federal and placement process bias the identification of minority children? The answer in those controversial and complex questions is that probably both explanations are partly true. So there. So how do you recognize and, and combat this cultural and racial bias that you have in referring these? This is a very interesting thing here. And today's teachers are mostly white. And again, they can count these almost exactly. 87% and female 70%. And thus, predominantly middle class educators are teaching increasingly in diverse student populations. So, the, what they imply here, and this is the part I can't, just bugs me, is that if you're white and a female, you can't possibly work adequately with these diverse kids. And if you do, you're going to over identify them. And I say to you again, then what should you do with kids that are delayed and causing problems in the classroom if you shouldn't off if you shouldn't ask for uh, special ed evaluations what is the answer some research contend african american behavior styles okay this is really interesting too uh, goes on here for example with respect to the overrepresentation of african american students in the emotional and behavior disorder categories some researchers contend that an African-American behavioral style conflicts with white teachers' expectations for the classroom behavior. Some researchers contend that an African-American behavioral style conflicts with white teachers' expectation for classroom behavior. Yeah, you heard it right. So that's the problem. You, white people, have unreal, uh, unreal expectations or unfair expectations of these African-American children. It goes on. When African-American students behave in modes affirmed and sanctioned by dimensions of African-American culture, those modes are unfamiliar or misinterpreted by teachers most of whom are white, their behavior is often perceived as inappropriate. In other words, the inference here is you don't really know what appropriate behavior is in your classroom. You're misinterpreting their behavior as inappropriate when it's not. And therefore you refer them and they become labeled as emotionally disturbed or behavior problems. Yeah, isn't that a kick in the teeth? Bias is the assessment of process by which contribute to the disproportionate numbers of culturally uh, diverse students in SPED. Uh, methods used to identify students for service are is inexact, right? It's, it's subjective. It's opinion. 
Many authors have argued that the likelihood of obtaining valid, accurate, unbiased assessment results are lower when the student in the question is from a culturally linguistic different background. So there. And that's about all. I mean, you can see they go on and on here, but we're, we're moving on to program planning because you're a racist and we just let it at that. Program planning, an individual education program, IEP, must be developed for children identifying as having a uh, disability. The first and pre-reveal, you identify, evaluate and identify, and now plan the program for them. Okay, an IEP, individual education program, is formed. If you determine through all this racist stuff that you do that they have a disability, the next thing is you have to develop an IEP, an individualized education program. And again, without hesitation, you have to understand what this is and be able to speak fluently, whether you're the regular teacher or the special ed teacher. By the IEP team determines the what, who, and when. Or there's a how in here. What, how, who, meaning who's going to do it, and when. Who does that? The IEP team. The IEP is the centerpiece of special ed process. A detailed uh, of a description of IEP appears later in this chapter. And again, there's not really time to get into it like we need to. So that's the process. The next one is the placement. The IEP team must determine the least restrictive educational environment. Least restrictive environment. So can I put some acronyms, some more acronyms here? that you've got to be familiar with, the IEP, LRE, uh, I'm not sure if it's a good acronym for that one, but let's go to placement. After the IEP team determines the child's educational needs and the special ed and related services necessary to meet those needs, the team then determines an educational setting in which the child can receive an appropriate education in the least restrictive environment. There. See, you're way ahead of that. You already got that. Where children with disabilities are taught is one of the most debated and often misunderstood aspects of special ed and idea, and is discussed in depth later in this chapter and throughout the next. But where? And so let's look at what those where's could be. I think it comes over here. Let me go back here. And then progress and monitoring, an annual review and reevaluation. So here's what you have to know about this. Progress monitoring, you have to has to be ongoing, no matter how appropriate the goals of a student of the IEP well conceived and designed, they have to be uh, monitored. Ongoing monitoring, ongoing data, what that means, you keep collecting data, you keep counting how fast they can read and how many words they know and how many uh, comprehension questions they can ask, they can answer. Schools are accountable for providing a free and appropriate public education and it requires measurements. Direct and frequent measurement, that's a term, Student performance provides the most meaningful information about student progress. So you have to do this. These are this. It has to be ongoing, but you have to do an annual review. At least annually, every 365 days, you have to review that IEP and look at how their progress towards goals with the parents, with the IEP team. It's not intended to be a permanent document. All aspects of the IEP, the annual goals, outcomes, delivery, and designated instruction related services must be thoroughly reviewed periodically and at least annually. And if you don't, if your school 
or if you're the spec teacher, if you don't do it before the 365th day, your IEP and your program is out of compliance. The IEP team revises the IEP to address any lack of expected progress in meeting annual goals or changes in the child's needs. And then reevaluation. Kids with mild disabilities now, design instruction related services may be a, a problem, such as they are no longer needed for eligible. So at least once every three years, the school must conduct that MFE again. And unless the parents and school agree it's not necessary, but for the most part, parents want to see this, want to see those tests run again, those assessments. So again, if on the third year, the 365th fifth day, if you have not done this, you are out of compliance. And you really rework the whole process that we did upon the initial referral. And sometimes you find at the end of this, students are no longer eligible for special ed services. Determine if the child still needs sped. If the IEP team decides the disability is no longer present or the child's education is no longer adversely affected by the disability, the student's declassified. We used to call it decertified. And the special ed continues. And where does the student go? They go back to the regular classroom. And sometimes special ed is characterized as a one way street, which is relatively easy to send children. They rarely return. And there's still a lot of criticism for that. And they make a case here. 17% uh, of the students have been declassified after two years and no longer receiving SPED services. Um, and sometimes that's a political thing, sometimes it's a numbers thing. Uh, what I saw in a, in a big middle school with a thousand kids, those kids that we decertified often really struggled once they no longer got the services. Another study based on nationally represented sample of children found that 16% of preschools who had received special ed services were declassified after two years. So this is about collaborating teaming. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Um, here's the different ones. And some of this is on the test, so you have to understand these differences. Here's one, uh, collaboration, uh, uh, you know, coordination, consultation. Um, you have to know what those are, and then teaming. And you have to have an understanding of each of these, a multidisciplinary team, which we just kind of talked about, an interdisciplinary team, and transdisciplinary team. And I'm not going to talk any more about that. Um, I'm going to ask you to put one sentence, and I think this is number nine. I'm going to ask you to put one sentence about each of these that helps you remember what they are. So one, two, three, and you're turning them red. That's number nine, and that's all we're doing with that. And number 10, one sentence about e what each of these are from the textbook. Here's the collaboration thing. Here's the different teaming ones. And here's the co-teaching one where you tell me what each of these are. And there's six of them, I think. All right, that's number 10. All right. Let's talk about um, let's talk about the IEP. It requires that IEP be developed and implemented for every student with a disability between the age of three and twenty-one. Individualized family service plans are developed for infants and toddlers birth to three. So I want you to write this in there or have this in there in red. IFSP stands for that. This is IEP, as you see in the title, and the difference is this is only from age three. There's no educational plan for somebody that birthed to three. That's working with the family, and we'll talk about that in another chapter. But you have to know this. I mean, some of the components are the same, but for here, for the most part, now, even at age three, it's a little bit hard to, uh, to give you that whole lesson, and that will come a little bit later. But at age three, those goals are dramatically different than when they're school age. Of course, school age is age six to 21. And what do they do after 21? We'll have a, a chapter on that transition. So for most of our uh, discussions, it's six days, approximately 18. And really, special ed is, is really drilled down to from about age six to, to 11 or six to nine. You know, beyond that, it becomes more managing than it is uh, remedial instruction. So who uh, who's on this team? 
and again I'm going to say to you you have to be know this without hesitation parents a general ed teacher somebody from the regular classroom a sped teacher an LE representative and here is number um, 11 is you're going to tell me what that is I talked about it earlier what is this an LEA representative an individual who can interpret results this is kind of a, a fluffy one because that could be you as the sped teacher specifically they're often asking for uh, a psychologist or something but just achievement tests could be you then others at the discretion of the parent or school now let me tell you what that looks like uh, school could be uh, like they may, the one thing I always did as a school representative is I asked for any probation officer or court service worker. A lot of the students I worked with were involved with the courts, and often they had uh, had a lot better relationship with them than the school did. The parents could bring grandparents, or one of the things that parents did rarely was brought advocacy, or some parent advocate. But this this is wide open on who can come based on if the school or the parent can invite them. Then the child with disability, when appropriate, if their input would be appropriate. Let's see what the textbook says about this. Here's the IEP team, and it gives you a little more descriptor for each of these. The parents of the child, and a parent's gets, I mean, that seems obvious, but I'm telling you, I had some stretches. I worked with kids that didn't have, weren't living with parents, so this could mean grandparent. Uh, I can remember one time when I got in all kinds of trouble that the mom was working, couldn't come, so she sent the boyfriend. And which was fine. Nobody had a problem until a week later the boyfriend disappeared from the home, took the truck, and cleaned out the bank accounts. The mother came back and said, I, uh, I want to rehold this IEP meeting because, well, I don't know why. But So parents isn't always a given either. But not less than one regular ed teacher, number three, not less than one SPED teacher. Then it tells you about who these local education agencies are so you can go there and uh, an individual who can interpret is number five the discretion of the parent others who have uh, uh, knowledge or special expertise regarding the child crew related service personnel one of the things I like to do is if the child had a severe disability or had some kind of issue where they had a full-time uh, teacher's aid with them I tried to invite the teacher's aid didn't always go well because the teacher's aid if these meetings were after school they were hourly people that their day ended at the end of the school day they weren't paid for beyond that so I remember one lady that always came but I had several others that absolutely uh, turned me down saying I need to get going and I'm not paid to do that and which I understood I get that then the IEP components and here's uh, this these are on the test you gotta know these without hesitation who's on the IEP team here's the components statements of a present level of academic achievement we used to call them plops present level of academic performance a statement of measurable goals statement how child progresses will be how they progress will be assessed statement of sped and related services supplementary aids explanation of the extent to which the student will not participate with non-disabled children a statement of individual assessment accommodations projects due dates beginning age 16 a transition now again think how vast this is let me remember that uh, when we first started I talked about this disabilities from these high incidence disabilities HID to these low incidence disabilities how different these would be the low incidences are the severe and profound disabled high incidence disabilities for those mildly disabled kids this these IEP things are just have as much range as those and so your uh, involvement with this will be so much dramatically different and all in between there what they are so here is a, a, a statement of each of these and I think we're on number 12 and I'm going to ask you to stop here and um, give me a, a one sentence about each of these that helps you remember and understand them because again on the test there's questions about these that you're gonna wanna be able to call up uh, unlike the team things I'm not going to say to you that you have to uh, without hesitation have a f understanding of these if you're the special ed teacher in the future you will without hesitation know these but if you're the regular ed teacher um, you'll know these but you won't have to uh, 
you know, ha have a working knowledge of them. These you will. These you won't. So this is number 12 here. Then the IEP functions and formats. They function and provide teachers and families with an opportunity to realistic, be realistic about children's goals, a measure of accountability, and this is the part that teachers hate because sometimes that student doesn't progress. And somebody's going to ask me in class what happens if they don't progress. Somebody in class, uh, when we're discussing this, have a chance you ask me if we're in class um, what happens if they don't progress. And then IEP formats widely across school districts. Uh, IEP is not the same as curriculum. IEP objectives are not comprehensive enough to cover the entire scope and sequence of students to learn. Um, what well, the formats are, uh, hopefully very few of these are paper anymore. Hopefully they're now digitized. But I know there's some places they're still doing them in paper. And unfortunately for us, uh, at the college level, at the university level, as we prepare you for teachers, it's hard to access those digital ones. So we, we're kind of uh, relegated to uh, paper. So let me go back here and see what else they have to say about that. There's the IEP components again. And so you're going to give me a sentence about those. Don't worry about that. Functions and the formats. Again, that's, uh, don't worry about that. Um, this is interesting. We'll try and take a look at this later on what these are, but you may want to just look at them if you want to know what IEP is. It gives you some uh, different things here of what it's about. Like here's some goals and objectives that go with these uh, these skills you want them to develop. And everybody has a different idea of how these should be written. And one of the most difficult tasks the IEP team is determining how inclusive the IEP team should be. It's important that educators and parents recognize that an IEP is not the same as curriculum or not comprehensive. Remembering a special ed is specifically designed instruction. Why does that matter? If it's not specifically designed, they should be in the regular classroom. This is just a holding pin. If you're not doing something dramatically different than they're doing in the regular classroom, this is not necessary. Put them back in the regular classroom. And I can't tell you how often I've observed this with student teachers where they're simply doing what they do in the regular classroom. And my thing is always then, why are they not in the regular classroom? Other than the number one uh, contentious thing that keeps them here is behavior. They don't behave. Um, adaptions to curriculum and instruction that differ significantly from the range of adaptions normally made in the general ed and the IEP teams necessary to remediate this. Each area of function that is adversely affected by the student has a, has should have an IEP goal. Here's a uh, sentence. Too often the IEP team's hard work and best intentions of a child's progress are muddled at best or lost altogether by IEP team goals that are impossible to measure. And this is interesting too, these uh, possible uh, problems and solutions. Uh, process has been problematic. And that's what I think is so interesting that this has been, it started in 1975 to today, uh, how many years that is of, uh, of special ed and still this IEP process is anything but straight. Wrote the IEP is probably the most single unpopular, well said, aspect of the law. Not only because, where does that go to? Let me see what it says. Not only because it requires a great deal of work, but also because the essence of uh, the plan itself seems to have been lost in the mountains of paperwork. And if you know anything about special ed, that's what you hear right away, the mountains of paperwork. More than 20 years later, they express a similar opinion. And every year when they go to reauthorize this, remember we said every seven years, they try and reduce the paperwork. So, so LRE is the setting that is closest 
doesn't mean it is. It's the closest to general ed classroom and also meets the child's bed needs. LRE is a relative and wholly individual concept, and I'm not sure why that word is, is so emphasized there. Removal from the general classroom should take place when the severity of the disability is that is such that an appropriate education cannot be achieved. It's not permanent, determined by the IEP team. Now, the thing that they don't talk about here, the number one determinant in my experience was behavior. Behavior of the child, almost exclusively that drove uh, for these mild disabled kids where they would get their service. Okay, so let me go back and see what they say about that. The students with widely varying disabilities can be actively involved in the AP process even to the point of leading the meeting. Some su research suggests a, p a positive correlation between students participation and their achievement. Um, Down here, regardless of the uh, level of parent and student participation, the appropriateness and measurability of the goals and the IEP team's satisfaction with the document without instruction of the highest quality, many children with disabilities will make little progress. And unfortunately, that's what I found, and I'll explain that sometime. This re uh, reality led to the requirement, uh, an idea that teachers use evidence-based practices. And the thing with evidence that they all call for is accountability. No teacher likes to be held accountable, it seems like. Oh, you don't believe that? But just think you're working with these really uh, struggling students who make uh, little incremental amounts of progress each month or week, and you're going to be held accountable for that. Now, don't let that scare you because one of your uh, challenges will be, and your friends will be, is evidence that you're uh, keeping track and that you're using uh, evidence-based uh, uh, practices. And you'll be fine, but everybody gets shook up about that. Then this LRE requires that every student with disabilities be educated in the least restrictive environment. Okay, let me say it again because, it, you, you, again, you want to have working knowledge of this. Idea: The federal law requires that every student with disability be educated in the least restrictive environment. So it says how, to, and it stipulates that to the maximum extent appropriate. And that's the buzz term that the feds give you that you want to be able to spew. Because one of the things to be cool and fit in, you got to spew their language. So here it is: the maximum extent possible appropriate. Children with disabilities, including children in the public or private or other care facilities, are educated with children who are not disabled and special classes separating schools and other removal of children with disabilities from the regular environment occurs only when the nature of the severity of the disability of children is such that education in the regular class uses uh, and use of supplementary aids and services cannot be achieved satisfactorily. Okay, and this is out of this law here, it was put in there, uh, but that's a mouthful. It said you have to consider you know, what are, the, how, what are the chances of succeeding in the regular classroom with these supplementary aids? So what is LRE? It's a setting that's most similar to the general classroom and also meets the child's special ed needs. Least restrictive environment is a relative, wholly individualized concept. It's not to be determined by a disability category. What does that mean? You have to consider each and every student independently of the others. The LRE for a 10-year-old student who is blind might be inappropriate for another 10-year-old with the same type of degree of visual impairment. That's what it means. And the LRE for both students uh, may change over time. Since the passive idea, there are many differences of opinion over which type of setting is least restrictive and most appropriate for students. Okay. Some educators and parents consider that any decision to place a student with disabilities outside the general classroom to be overly restrictive. In other words, some uh, educators believe there is, should be no pull-out room, that all education and special ed services should be provided in the regular classroom. Most, however, recognize that a full-time placement in a general classroom is restrictive and inappropriate if the child's educational needs cannot be adequately met in that environment. And every time you go to a large special ed setting, this is a topic of debate. So, a continuum, and this is a word I want you to be able to use because you want to be cool and be on the in-group in the educational settings, and especially in SPED, you want to be able to use that term, the continuum of placements, of alternative placements, meaning what are the choices we have 
in this continuum of placements. Okay, here is the continuum. Let me see. It starts at the bottom, least restrictive, many, the most children. So the least restrictive is general classroom. The highest percentage are in the rare ed classroom. The next is the general ed classroom with consultation, meaning a special ed teacher that works with the regular teacher. And then a general ed classroom with supplementary instruction, meaning maybe that teacher's in there. So those are three in the rare ed classroom. And then the resource room, and then a separate classroom, a separate school, a residential school, and a homebound or hospital. A few of these most restrictive. And here they are. Regular classroom, classroom with consultation, classroom with supplementary, and then the resource room. And in the public schools, this is the most common uh, thing. The most common is the regular classroom, but uh, special ed, for the most part, will look like some part of the day in the resource room. And then it gets, it should be the other way, it should be flipped here, then a separate classroom. That's like pull out for severe and profound kids. And then a separate school, and sometimes behaviors, when I was teaching behaviors, and then they may have to live there to really get the support they need or if they're really ill, they may need to be homebound or hospital. That is the continuum of appropriate services. Continuum of appropriate services. We're going to talk about inclusive education. Students with disabilities in general education classrooms uh, requires that students with disabilities in education settings are close to the general as possible. Uh, placement in the SPED setting does not guarantee the child receive the specialized instruction they need. Does not guarantee that a child will receive the specialized instruction they need. Cooperative learning activities provide a strategic and here is a buzz that's kind of went away, that's kind of making a comeback. And that is where everybody has a job. I want to see if they have anything in the textbook about cooperative learning. Okay, here's cooperative learning. They have You have group goals in cooperative learning. And then you have individual accountability. I say when I, this was four, 30 years ago, it was a big thing, but it's kind of making a comeback of what it is. And so I want you, uh, what are we up to about, trying uh, to patriotic approach for integrating students' with disabilities. I want you to give me a couple sentences here. What are we on here about, uh, that was 12, so this is number 13. Um, I want you to tell me number 13 here, and, and you put it in red, what is cooperative learning beyond this? Bring this from the textbook. Some statements about um, cooperative learning. Promoting uh, inclusion with cooperative learning. Okay. And that kind of goes back with the other one. You can uh, here you can bring your goals in here for uh, thirteen. Can be any of this, but you you make this make sense. And this is interesting. The arguments for full inclusion. 
you get to make the argument against. Because here in the textbook it says for and against, but they only put the for inclusion in there. You are going to make uh, a case against it. So arguments for full inclusion, interesting the textbook has uh, has a little different take on it. It says that arguments are for and against full inclusion. So what you're going to get to do is you make the case against. Uh, here's, the, uh, here's the case for and whether you have to uh, Google it or what have you, you come up with at least five and this is number 14. Sorry, 14 entries. Number 14 entry is against. You make, uh, let's say, five uh, things. How about this? One, two, three, four, five, six. Let's make it six entries against. Full inclusion. And the textbook will help you some, but you're going to have to Google off. And then where does it go from here? I thought this interesting also is this text can't really... Uh, have this conversation without throwing this word in here. Matter so as a matter of social justice, which is a a code word for uh, well for a lot of politically charged things, and that's this author's uh, thing on a lot of his uh, angles is social justice, and uh, he, that may. Uh, not have any meaning to you, but it may. But it it's, it sets off an alarm in me that Dr. Heward's thing is that this whole thing is about a matter of social justice. Um, 